that you don't just eat the flax seed without crushing it because it'll just pass through your system because of the, <coughs> the skin it has there. Where does the pint? Pints a pound the world around. Where does it come from? I am sure that the Roman legions found that that quantity, the pint, was the amount of food you ate at a meal. Because I found that, that using that quantity for formulating in our programs, that it seemed to exactly allow you to cook the right amount of people for a given number of, of participants. The mile, mille passus, a thousand paces, a pace is two steps. The Roman legions, wherever they went, if there weren't markers, they put them up as they traveled through the country so they'd know how far they were away from everything. And we dropped the passus and we call it the mile, the mila, which means that a thousand paces of me, the pacers in the Roman legion must have been my stature because I'm within about 10, 25 feet of the mile if I pace and count, count a thousand paces. On and on. You want a machete? But that machete is the same length as the Roman sword, the gladius. You'll find there's something about the exact length in connection with the chopping action and the, and the situation. They always found that it was always a good day when they would have to fight with the guys with the big long swords because they were so easy to fight with, with their short swords and on and on. And it's always interesting if you're wondering about the apocalypse, why did Rome in its heyday when they were such a powerful entity, how they eventually went for a shit and crumbled due to the fact that humans can't seem to sustain their culture without it going rotten eventually to greed and other things. It's interesting to know those things because there are a lot of cultures that have come up and, uh, and disappeared on account of some mechanism that that is organized as, as, uh, as you would be, that eventually it goes, uh, people who are supposed to know better don't seem to know how to last. I don't know what it would be like if the Romans were still in power, but they went out of power. But it's an interesting part of our history. I took Latin when I went to university, and I would say that if you don't force your children to take Latin, you're really creating a serious disservice because the Latin helps you with your speech and all that sort of stuff so, so much that it should be part of almost everybody's education. Of course, it's not for everybody, but the elitists, whatever, the writer, the journalist, the person, and so on, I, I would say Latin can be a very big help with regard to facilitating your acquisition of your language and polishing your language. Anyway, the POTS issue is something you won't find anywhere else. And after that, survival considerations. There's a page there that if you read it, you'd see what I think about survival. And then you end up having a kind of a big circle. And then below it, there's a big chart. The circle is defining survival, which I'll touch upon for a few minutes. And the other chart, to bring to your attention, it's the uh, one of the most extensive, profound cases of plagiarism that I've ever <coughs> perpetrated. I put a lot of effort in creating that chart. Probably the most valuable piece of single paper that I've ever created, and it's in actual centimeters. <laughs> so if I asked you, how thick of a sleeping bag do you need to sleep? At uh, 40 below, you look at 40 below, well, when it's 40 in both scales is the same, and you take your fingers and you say that thick. You don't have to tell me it's inches and so on. So you can visualize thicknesses of clothing, and there is, uh, if, if you put this into words, that page would probably take 20, more, 20 or more pages to describe the items. But here it is. On the side is centimeters and inches, and on the bottom is Celsius and Fahrenheit. And the blank, uh, funny little things there. For example, in the sleeping bag, if you look at it, if you were to look at it later, I require probably two centimeters less in my sleeping bag than my wife does, maybe. So we have that range of variation. The humanity at least varies at least a couple centimeters in thickness. 
So that's what those blank areas are there. In one blank area, it says when you're sleeping, you're burning 50 calories an hour. If you're standing, you're burning 100. So don't, don't stand when you should be laying. If you're doing light work, 150. If you're walking, it's 250. If you're pulling a heavy toboggan and the snow is deep and you're wearing snowshoes, you might be burning 450 calories an hour. And you'll see that when you burn 450 calories an hour, a cross-country skier, when I've officiated at those, they come off of the race and you're standing about six feet and you put your hand like that and you can feel the heat coming off of that individual. So he can't wear too much clothes, otherwise he'll be just drenched with sweat. So they're wearing, and if they're wearing clothing to, to compete in a cross-country ski event and they hit a tree and they're laying in the snow, they get chilled very fast because they're wearing very little insulation because they can't. Just like a cyclist, he's cycling way up this hill really hard and then he gets to the top of the hill. Now he's subjected to hypothermia because very little effort is required and he's whizzing through the air, freezing to death. So you got these sort of extremes that come in. But anyway, you look at the, you look at an area here. There's an area where you can sleep naked. That's a good thing to know. If you're sleeping in your bedroom in the summer and you find you've tossed off even the sheets, do you go to the thermostat and say, what's the fucking temperature? Which I don't even need sheets. <laughs> and you'll discover that's an important temperature to know where you can sleep naked. Because above that and below that, you have to do something about the situation. Now, it's one thing to be active burning 50 or burning 450 calories, but when you're sitting still, that's what gets you. So you always got to say, I can only go so long without sleep. So here I am, I can keep warm by being active. And then when I'm sleeping, I'm not hardly moving and I don't have any camping gear. What am I going to do about that? Well, if you're today, tonight, you would have a pretty rough time of it. It's kind of cold tonight. Well, it's not as cold as it can be, but we've actually hadn't had a winter yet. This is remarkable in that how warm a winter we've had. But anyway, this is a very important piece of paper when it comes to the insulation of your clothing and the insulation of your sleeping bag. And it tells you when snow shelters come into their own if the temperature is high enough, they're uninhabitable. The colder it gets, the better snow works as a form of insulation. You could be so well dressed in a certain way that if it's 40 below, you might do quite well by burrowing into the snow. And you might find you might not be perfectly comfortable, but you won't freeze to death. So your clothing has to reflect the issue that you are thinking of burrowing into the snow at some point because that's the way you're going to stay warm because you choose not to have a fire that's big enough. Or if the snow conditions are right, you'll build a small <coughs> bubble and you'll live in there and your heat will heat the interior of that bubble that the clothing you have brought will be sufficient to you for you to sleep because you've chosen that method out of the alternatives. Anyway, so that's what that sheet is. But the one above it, there's a circle there and I'm attempting to define survival I've been trying to define survival <coughs> for 45 years and I still haven't figured it perfectly. What is survival knowledge? Survival knowledge is what allows one to deal with the potentially lethal stresses in an unfamiliar environment. For four minutes, no air, four days, no water. 40 days no food, for example. There are a lot of limiting factors that come in. And I still have yet to come up with a definition that sounds, sounds, uh, you know, official. When you get a survival manual, see if they define it. And if they don't, you might not be getting your money's worth. Anyway, so here you got a situation that's quite cold. If you're not dressed for it, you might get so cold you perish from it. You go wandering off into some parts of the country and you discover you get awfully thirsty. 
And you can only go so long without a drink of water. You can only go so long without sleep. <coughs> You're driving on the highway and a policeman happens to be following you and you seem to be a bit erratic, so he pulls you over. And if you admit that you haven't slept for 48 hours, you are just as, what do you call it? Impaired, impaired as if you were drunk. You're gonna be charged with driving impaired because you haven't slept for 48 hours. More people die from <coughs> people falling asleep at the well, at the wheel, than from drunken drivers. And there's a, quite a few people die from drunken drivers. So it's a significant one, but it doesn't hit the news that often. If you keep driving to the point where you become sleepy, that's uh, quite the Russian roulette. So to me, there's two things you got to do to survive. You got to get enough sleep and you got to drink enough water. Your survival kit should reflect that. When I look at a kit, I'll say, how come, what, what has this razor blade got to do with me being able to sleep that much better or meet my water needs? And all the little bits of garbage that you find in a lot of kits that actually are quite costly. They don't fulfill that requirement. Why are you carrying it if it doesn't help you to find your, the sleep you require and doesn't help you with the water you need? That's what the focus should be. Well, right now I'm working on a folding pot. Get the right sort of aluminum and I can fold a pot that will sit flat in my vest. Doesn't take so much room because the pots that we have, unless they're rectangular, are so awkward to fill with stuff, they're not easy to carry, but a foldable pot. Mm -hmm. It's about the size of a big envelope or something that's pulled apart and you can melt water, <coughs> measure water. You think that's possible? Oh yeah, I'll what? be, uh, I'll, I'll, next visit I'll come, I'll demonstrate how far I've gotten with that. Okay, I would love to see that. The, um, anyway, so you now know that your focus is meeting your sleep needs and um, uh, as I talk more and more you'll see how we try to achieve that sort of thing. Generally, when you're surviving as such, we ask, what sort of survival are you after? Is it sleeping bag survival? Is it axe survival? Saw survival? All of these things make life easier for the person who is worried about a lack of knowledge, how to get by without a lot of things. It's awfully hard for you to find a substitute for this vest. So when I take a pot, a seven cup pot, and I put a big metal match in the bottom, and maybe seven arm spans of paracord, then I stuff the vest in there, and then I tape it up. That's gonna walk circles on an awful lot of kits I see out there where you might end up paying $50 for. But they got little bits of snare wire and a few fish hooks and a bonbon and, <laughs> <laughs> and a little pen, and I mean a pencil and paper, but they don't have the things well, I include in there a Mylar, a Mylar tube tent, which today you can buy for $2. Well, I'll talk about that in a while. <coughs> so anyway, my views are, and I discern this time gone on, that it seems this very same environment changes to three distinct environments. The environment in the summer, full of mosquitoes and bears, the iron, the environment where it's bitter cold and there is no snow, and the environment where the snow is so deep and I need snowshoes. Very same place, yet three distinct methods of survival. Well, I have these booklets that if you haven't got them, you might acquire them. The uh, one booklet says how to survive when it's cold and there is no snow. That's probably the most important one. Then is how to survive in the snow so deep you need snowshoes. And I haven't written the one, how to survive in the summer, yet. There are 32 pages. The 32 page booklets invariably, as a rule of thumb, are perfect course manuals for three day course. So if I took any two of those books and I was doing the right job, <laughs> out of the 18 books you got to choose from, two of them are needed for this course. How to survive when it's cold and there is no snow, and then pick any other that you want, like uh, how to tie the knots that you need for the rest of your life. Anyway, when I try to, 
hope I didn't destroy good stuff. Now let's draw. We could draw a library, but instead we're going to draw a pie. We're talking about a lifestyle that perhaps somebody living right here, a thousand years ago, what did that person know to be able to live here? Because obviously, when the white man arrived on this continent, there were a lot of people living here. They managed without the same uh, approach to livelihood as was done in Europe. So what would that person need to know from as far as we can guess in order to do so? That might have some kind of bearing on the type of training that we wish in order to, you know, create a syllabus for a survival training program. Well, <coughs> my thinking says that if he had a hundred bucks, 75% of them would be on the flora. The wild plants see it to be edible, useful, medicinal, magical, and poisonous. Of the flora, there are plants that have blossoms, flowering plants. There are mushrooms. There are also lichens and ferns, more primitive plants. But I would say that that individual was able to live here because there wasn't any plant in his environment he pretty well didn't have a use for. And he knew what the plants were because they didn't live in apartments like we do. They're exposed to them on a daily basis. The people who are raising you are anxious you learn all that sort of stuff. I come from a Polish tradition. What I found there, we didn't have toys to play with. Well, I did. There were airplane parts of all the airplanes that crashed around the big training base of Prince Albert, one of the, the Commonwealth. There were so many crashes that we had altimeters and bolts and all kinds of pieces of aircraft because they crashed not far from our farms. It was, I mean, I remember as a kid, an airplane making funny sounds and I see the airplane going down, out jumps the pair, pilot. A short while he shows up in the yard and asks if we have a telephone. No, we don't. I remember that as a little kid, four years old probably. My mother says, no, we don't have a telephone. Well. Can I have a drink of water? <laughs> he had to hike another mile to get to the telephone. Well, we located that plane eventually. There were a lot of crashes. We knew that planes flew backwards because we'd watch planes. And if you're standing there, you can see the plane moving backwards because we knew airplanes could go in reverse. Everybody says, oh, airplanes can't fly backwards. We knew they flew backwards because we watched them backing up. <laughs> Well, if the wind is blowing strong enough and you're flying slow enough, you're going to move backwards. We'd see that. But the consternation that we felt that people would tell us you're liars. It's impossible for a plane to fly backwards. But the inconvertible truth is there. We can see them moving backwards. So the adults didn't take the time to see that. And so they poo pooed the fact that we made the observation that airplanes could fly backwards. Well, anyway. Well, it's a long story. I like to digest. Anyway, 75% is on the flora. Now, in Alberta, we have 1,800 flowering plants. In Canada, we have 3,500 flowering plants. And in one square mile of Brazilian jungle, we probably have 3,500 flowering plants. So we really don't have very many plants. And as you get used to these plants, You'll classify them into edibles. We are just saturated with medicinal plants. <coughs> Edibility, now harder, much, much harder, because the wild plants that would fulfill your, stu fill your stomach, the lands that had those plants got plowed under by the settlers and the pioneers. It takes a special type of environment. Like, for example, Chip Lake is a close one, but now probably you could survive there on vegetable type of um, sustenance from mid-May to mid-September, but there's not many environments where I've spent time like I have in Dawson Creek, and it happens to be there, an area there where the stinging nettle, the cow parsnip, and you know, the, many of the important edible plants that grow there, and the reason it was never farmed was there were so many springs that the type of forest that was there, which is substantial with birch and many other things, was unfarmable. 
so within a short distance of, of town you've got this area that's still like it was years ago and, and all the edible plants that are there were, um, uh, were enough to sustain you in, in the, the amount of biomass available to you. So that's the only place that I can, with arrogance and confidence, say that if I made a serious up bet, that'd pay me $10,000. I'd go and I'll live there for $10,000 and live off of the wild edible plants and nothing else from mid, mid May to mid September for sure. Anyway, so the issue here now will be the how many animals? I think there's 17 animals. I think five books will probably cover. You gotta know enough about the animals to catch them when you're hungry enough and to avoid them when they're hungry enough. <clears throat> it's very easy to find enough to eat in a jungle. Trouble is, all the <laughs> plants and animals in the jungle wanna eat too, eat you. You gotta be actively working against them attacking and eating you sort of thing. But in our environment, things are kind of, well, <coughs> Got to appreciate the native people that were here before we came. They managed. Well, how many years of university do you have to take to become as good as that person a thousand years ago who was able to sustain themselves directly from the environment? And some of them lived to a good old age. Uh, there's a book, uh, Alberta Archaeology, out there. And it said that the people who lived in the boreal forest up here if you were managed to live past certain landmarks of age, and you, you would then have a good chance of growing old. But once a decade, your group, family group or tribal group, would experience famine so great yeah. that, that death would occur to a certain amount of the population. Yeah. And that's with a village of trained people with generations of knowledge yes. and highly skilled knowledge of the land, and yet even with that high level of skill, once a generation, they starve to death. Yeah. <laughs> well, the issue is that if you live through your 80, which I think was common enough, you'd have to endure famine. You know, it's, it's tied in with uh, sunspots, 11 year cycle. So there is this immense fluctuation. And I sort of gotten some insights into this because for 17 years, I would be out there, the snow when I would arrive in Dawson Creek, there would be substantial snow, and then I would go home on the last on the last week of June. So I was there every day with the kids, seeing what's happening. I could see the plants. Some years the biomass was unbelievable, and some years it was unbelievably scant, and some years it was unbelievably rushed. So that when the issue is to do with the amount of rainfall you get and all the other sort of things. There can be a lot, but there are times that, that uh, so if you live till you're 80, you almost starve to death. And eight times of which maybe twice you died. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's the same. I don't even know where I got the, what I'm saying, but maybe I'll have to, if you've got the bibliography of that, it'd be nice for me to, to, to check it out to see where the heck I got what I'm just saying. Anyway, so if you starve to death, it wasn't because of your lack of knowledge. There was nothing to eat. <laughs> you just got to realize that there's no magic to the issue. Now, if you can live off the land the way that guy did a thousand years ago, everybody in is extremely envious of your ability and background knowledge. And the people that discuss all of that a great deal and the, uh, the, the rabbit stick and everything say, hey, that's a very enviable skill to acquire is the ability to sustain yourself directly, exclusively from Mother Nature. And then I will say, well, you know, I was brought up on a farm. And the way I meet people in general, if you went and grew a garden, so you'd have one meal a day for 365 days. And you had to grow those potatoes and those cabbages and those carrots. You might just say that that was a kind of a pretty serious challenge. So if you're worried about the apocalypse, you might as well forget about sustaining yourself off of the wild edible and useful medicinal plants. If edibility is the problem, you better focus on how to grow that garden because the transition is gonna take more from a modern person that, than you realize 
Well, there's one person here that might succeed at that. That's Mr. Harleton. Uh, he just about created a, a situation by his inclination to eat certain things in the environment if you convince him that they're edible. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a long story. <laughs> but uh, if he was around and he said that's edible, he just, he just, that was his thing. And uh, one time there was these mushrooms. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I said they were edible, but they, they were almost unpalatable. <laughs> My parents would dry them and use them for flavoring. And Kelly picks a large quantity and cooks up for everybody. And then one of the students almost dies. And I'm saying, holy mackerel. Unfortunately, I went through the same uh, experience that the student did. And the only reason that I didn't panic is I would kept saying, I hope it's the same result as what happened to me when I poisoned myself with mushrooms. And there's one thing you want to do, you want to do <laughs> is, is put yourself in a position where you figure you've poisoned yourself because you don't know whether you should shit or go blind or what to do or write your will or whatever it is because the situation is that you honestly feel you could die from what you just did. Well, that's not a experience that you will do a get too often in your life. You know, I almost died from eating a boil, uh, um, a, uh, an egg that was rotten and it got boiled and I had a bad cold and I ate that boiled egg that was initially rotten and I ate it without realizing it was spoiled. I came very close to dying, I'll tell you. The violent reaction that I got from that boiled egg was something. That, uh, but one day I ate too many mushrooms and I, I'll tell the story sometime, maybe next time I come. So we got more important things to talk about. And then Kelly instigated one of the students eating too much of this, this mushroom. And uh, he, you know, he went unconscious periodically, he vomited. He, was, he had saliva that ran all the way from his mouth to the ground. And, uh, and you know, I'm like saying, well, that all happened to me. I hope it's no worse because I survived that and he did. And uh, it was uh, something that uh, we, we live and learn occasionally. Uh, uh, a lesson ends up happening that wasn't particularly <laughs> enjoyable. Anyway, so we got 75 books in this library of 100 books that are flora and five are on animals. Well, hantavirus, for example. The native people that lived in teepees had to move almost every three weeks because they got so overrun by voles and other little creatures that were so destructive and left their little tokens of like sensens, <laughs> whatever it is. And that could possibly instigate a serious disease in the human if you don't deal with that. Well, now the big thing is that, that uh, mosquito that causes uh, Micro, what was it? Microcephaly. Microcephaly. Zika. Microcephalia. That's the Zika. Now, there's one more. And that's a good book. So I would call that 1%. No. Animal, vegetable, mineral. You got a rock. What do you do with a rock? If you can't do it with your teeth, you're probably going to have to crack a rock. If you don't know how to char a, a stick and make it sharp enough to penetrate the height of a, of a deer, then you might want to put a sharp little arrowhead on the end. might do a better job. I don't know. But it's not very much that you need to know to get a lot of benefit. But there's still a lot left over. If you're a nitpicker, you'd say 19 books left. Well, let's, let's roughly say 20% of this part here, the mysterious part here. What else could there be? You got plants, you got animals, you got rocks. Well, this little piece of pie I call 